I've only cared about how can I pay nothing out of pocket. That's all I cared about. How can I spend as little cash out of pocket as possible? Uh, I've heard, like, I've gotten this question before, like, who is Anthony Venture? And Are you team cash back or team travel? Uh, this question. <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay. You're going to be grilling me, but wait, let me ask you. You've had a platinum card for longer than I've been alive. The best thing to do and the most romantic thing is to book a first class ticket and then let them sit in economy. It's the most romantic thing you could. <laughs> and I get a little emotional thinking about it. But maybe one day it could be some sort of like household name. I don't know. I don't know why I think about it like that. But I don't know. Maybe one day it could mean something <laughs> to somebody. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? We got Anthony Venture in the house. What's going on, man? What's going on? How's everything? Man, it's great, man. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I got here to South Carolina last night. We've been filming some collab videos and having a good time. And I want to thank you for this time we're going to share here today with everyone. And before we write, get into it, I'm sure most of y'all that are watching this know you. But go for it, man. Share a little about yourself and we'll get crack a lack it. <laughs> crack, crack a lack it. That's, that's what I'm about. I love getting crack a lack That's right. So, so uh, I've heard, like, I've gotten this question before, like, who is Anthony Venture? And honestly, the only thing I could really boil it down to is just somebody who gets obsessed with things and then does nothing else but that for a season which might last three to four years so you know if you talk to me 10 10 years ago it was the season of working out and nutrition and eating you know all the right things and all these different things a couple of years later maybe i was a language learner now that's my identity at that time a couple of years later i'm a driving teacher aficionado teaching people how to drive in new york state and teaching people how to get their license and then you know a couple of years later now it's finance and then now it's youtube and credit cards so i don't know I, there's no one thing that i could really point to that i am it's just like I will get obsessed with one thing and that'll become my identity for that amount of time over that. And then over time, maybe I get bored of that or I get to a sufficient level level and then I'll move on to the next thing. And then I kind of forget that side of me for, for a very, very long time. So I don't know. What am I? What am I? I, I get a, I'm a person who gets obsessed. I think that, <laughs> that's all I can really say, to be honest. I don't think I'm, I have anything else but that. No, that's awesome. And man, you're so funny, dude, in person. Oh. He, he's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> So I got to ask you, how old are you and how many credit cards do you have? All right. I am 26. We'll be 27 next month, though. Please send me some gifts. P.O. Box. You know, I have no P.O. Box. <laughs> but uh, um, And I have, uh, I think there's 13 active cards. But I think I've had like 18, but I canceled a bunch. I don't even know. To be honest, I have no idea anymore. I don't, <laughs> up until recently, I didn't even really know my how many hard pulls I had, my 524 status really, you know, but you know, who knows? But, uh, yeah, I think it's like 13 active at 26 years old. So half every year, <laughs> half nice. a part of year. Nice. <laughs> so how we're going to do this, and it's pretty impressive by the way, is we're going to cover some credit cards first. And then from there, we're going to go into more everything, general money and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then we'll dig a little deeper of the stuff you alluded to in the beginning of how you came to be your origin story, if I may. Oh, okay. Yeah. So with that, we'll start it off. Are you team cash back or team travel? Ah, this question, <laughs> we're really going there. Team cash back and team travel. Unreal. Um, so I, you, everything has to have a caveat, right? And the caveat is, well, you can say you're team travel, but do you actually travel? And I would say so far I've been doing as best job I could possibly do to be actually a team travel person. I've been trying to go to all new places and new lands and trying to book a lot of experiences that I never really did prior to. So I have to say I'm team travel that I'm like, I have to say I'm on my training wheels to becoming a true team travel person. Um, as Luke's points a mile to say an actual human that, you know, actually <laughs> living like a person, you know, so I, I appreciate the cashback people, but I, and I agree that a lot of people probably can get outsized returns, like 5% here and there. Um, I just like the variability and versatility of points where I could cash them out or I can use them for life-changing vacations, you know, down the line and whatnot. So, you know, and I feel like if I got cash back, I'd be more than likely to just spend it. Whereas the points are in their own separate account. I'm not as likely to actually use that until I need, I need to. So team travel, that's the <laughs> long winded, uh, what I was, yeah, team travel. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, I'm right there with you. So give me a high five for team travel. Oh gosh. <laughs> Holy moly, dude. That was on camera, bro. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. Okay. You almost fell over. All right, sorry, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I, I don't trust you. I don't, no, no, no. All right. 
So, okay, what is your favorite credit card? And just start talking. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm, right, I'm a menace. Um, I think my favorite credit card is the Platinum. I hate how, you know... Which one? Oh, sorry. The the Amex Platinum, just the you know, standard Platinum card. Well, sorry, the Charles Schwab Platinum, I think, is my favorite card. And maybe that's a cliche cliche answer, but I feel like, you know, since I've had the Platinum card over the last four years, I've really, I've come to love and grow into it a little bit more since I'm actually able to travel a little bit more than I never really did the last four years. I really think it was a waste of time for me the last three years, but this year I've been getting a lot of benefits. Like I'm starting to actually do lounge access. So that's a lot of fun to, to do for like the first time. Um, I'm finally getting benefits out of the concierge service and getting me like awesome reservations downtown Greenville with the Via Resi through their concierge service on valentine's day um so that's like a lot of fun using fhr to, for some like literally the best hotel stay i've ever been to so far in the fhr property i did in savannah georgia um it was a hyatt um hyatt thompson so it's like all these different things that the the platinum card can give you has been delivering basically this last year for me which is it's why it's propelled it really to the top spot, I would say, this year and probably going forward. Also, to quote Cesar Joel, great guy, he mentions that the Platinum card is the only card that can cover your entire travel experience. I mean, statuses like Marriott, you know, Gold, uh, you know, Gold Hilton, Gold Marriott. Um, if you're talking about, you know, uh, of course, a wide range of lounge access, you, you don't just have Plaza Premium or Centurion Lounge. You don't just have a Sapphire Lounge. No, I have Plaza Premium. I got, you got Priority Pass. You got all these different, you know, uh, Escape Lounges and Delta Lounge, all these different lounges, all encompassing on one card. Plus, you have your hotel credits to, 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 so pretty much what I'm saying is it, I agree with Cesar that it does actually encompass your entire travel itinerary from the hotels to the flights to the statuses when you get to the hotels um and even like food and ride share and stuff like that it pretty much covers your entire travel experience from front to end excluding multipliers so if you're looking for multipliers it's not the platinum but for all the other extra benefits that you're prepaying for i would say sure i have gotten an added outsized value just by holding that card i think so i also like the amex platinum so that's pretty cool i will ask you if your team travel and shout out to you, Cesar. I would say, where are you using the points that you're cashing out? So my understanding is the feature of the Charles Schwab Amex Platinum, the big difference is you can use your points and transfer them out at a 1.1 ratio. In other words, if you got like 10K worth of points, that could be worth $110 into your Charles Schwab brokerage account. So do you actually utilize that feature or is there something extra of why you love the Charles Schwab Platinum? Or do you use like half cash out redemptions, half travel? What's kind of the story here so there's a couple a couple things so, so one no i haven't technically done the, the cash out yet but i actually was going to do it very very soon because i wanted to actually do what spencer did once which was cash out points for a computer so i can you know use it for whatever i want to use it for um so and just, shout out to spencer johnson sorry to cut you off out. there Shout out. He's the first one on the watch his episode after this one. Yeah. A, <laughs> it was a good episode. But yeah, I, I feel there's a world where I'll take maybe, you know, Amex points are crazy, man. And the Schwab is really insane because there's a few moving parts. Like I'll, I'll so basically when you have the Schwab and you cash out 1.1, I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with that. So even if I just signed up for, like I did recently, but messed it up, you get an Amex checking account and I get a 50 K bonus just by like depositing 5 K and, and I, and, and doing that. That's like via the Schwab, $550 in cash, that's a pretty decent computer if you need one yeah. or whatever, you, 500 that could be your rent, you know, $550 if maybe you're half of the rent or something like that. So I love having that versatility, but if you're talking more points and miles strictly, a lot of people will transfer their Amex points to Hilton when there's like a bonus and sometimes it could be worth it based on whatever the redemption is. But a lot of the times, I don't know if people realize, but you can just cash out the Schwab for cash, use that to book cash for your Hilton stays, uh, and you can use like a Hilton credit card, maybe have an Aspire and get you 34x per dollar spent at those Hilton hotels, plus the base points, And but you're just reimbursing yourself with the cash via the Schwab, via your Amex points. And that redemption probably would be better than just transferring it to Hilton, even factoring in a bonus. Um, like probably a lot off a lot more often than people would assume so like even just something as simple as that yeah the, the schwab and having that versatility is like amazing and then again if you don't want to cash it out then okay just use it how everyone else is using it for uh <laughs> crazy business flights going abroad even though time goes on and i don't see too many people using their amex points for that i'm seeing more people use their chase points for that so i think in a world where maybe amex points are a little hard to redeem eh, the 1.1 is not a bad option 
it's not a bad option, especially like for you guys, you might have seen that 250k bonus on the business platinum card. I mean, if you got like 15k to spend, that's like you know what is that three thousand dollars in cash cash back? Literally, I mean, you could be a cash back person with a Charles Schwab platinum card. So I I love it for that reason. It's versatility and it comes with everything the vanilla platinum card does. That's a very smart um, way and a strategy that I probably thought of personally that I remember many many years ago, mm-hmm. and I didn't even rethink about it. So what I'm getting at is. Back when I had the Charles Schwab Platinum, it was 1.25 cents per point. Mm. So like 10K is worth 125 bucks instead of 110 today. But I love what you're saying is you're literally saying, just an example, if you get, let's say, you know, 100,000 points is 11, 10, like dollars, 1,110. Yeah. yeah. And now if you spend, let's say, at some Hilton property and get that 34X, like you're saying with the Hilton Aspire, yeah. you're basically getting, let's say, half a cent per point for Hilton. So like 17% back, you agree? Exactly. Yeah. So 17% back on top of the fact of, you know, you have 1.1, you're actually getting almost, you know, rough it out, but like, um, another 20% plus, right? Basically. Mm-hmm. So like almost 1.2, like way more. And like, that's more scalable as you have more points. So yeah. very, very cool. I think another thing, another thing too, that I've been thinking of that some people who are really into the cent per point game kind of don't think it's necessarily the greatest idea, but I think something really interesting and something I was also going to do pretty soon, possibly, um, then I'll make a video about it if I do, but basically taking those points out, like if I want to book a hotel via FHR, like some people, I think you might forget like, oh, I can book fine hotels or resorts hotels and not use my $200 credit. Like it's not just a one-time thing. You could use it and just pay cash. You have the platinum card, so you might as well take advantage of fine hotels, resorts, if it makes sense. Like if the price is low enough and you're willing to pay for that. But I just think an interesting proposition, (laughs) value prop would be, okay, I want to book this $200 hotel, have it be the Roosevelt, Waldorf Astoria and, and New Orleans. Um, or New Orleans, if you're from there, um, two, that's $200, uh, or like 200 before taxes and fees, I think something like that. Um, so theoretically, I mean, after taxes and fees, what would that be? Maybe 21,000, 22,000 Amex points that you would cash out via the Schwab would cover that complete, that stay completely. But if you do that, you also, well, in one part, do what we said, get the 17% return on the, on on the, uh, if you're paying with like, um, Hilton Aspire, what have you, because I guess you could do that through the portal. You're also going to get all the base points that you would get for that stay. So, um, I guess, yeah, well, I guess that, that breaks into the 34 X you get all your dining credits, but then you get all the benefits with FHR. Like you might get an upgraded room, but you also going to get a hundred dollars towards an experience credit. Usually it's going to be towards the onsite restaurant or if they have a spa there, whatever. And then usually another $60 towards breakfast credit. So what once was maybe a $250 hotel room, I now have minimum $160 in credits that you get through fine hotels and resorts. And basically 90% of the time, I heard some people not, but I think they're not asking. But every time I've done it, I've gotten the Hilton dining credits as well. So if you have diamond status or you have gold status, really... You can, if that's a whole other story, there's another $50 in dining credits. So $210 in dining credits for a stay that's $250. Maybe you're going going crazy. You're not going to eat that much, but I do. And this is actually how I booked the Waldorf in DC that I'll be going to in, in the in the future. And I have $210. I'm going to have $210 in, in food credits for like a $400 stay. So I'm like, okay, so the bring it all down. Sorry, it's a little long with it. 250 hotel stay. It only really costed me 23,000 Amex points, but I got back $210 worth of food credits, which I mean, I'm someone who likes to eat food at the hotels. I, I'd rather use the 210 than to go out and have a restaurant. I'll do that maybe another night, whatever. But I want to use all the money that I'm getting through the hotel and save that amount of money. So I don't know. Like, what do you even rank that in cent per point? Like, I'm literally getting back almost the cost of the hotel and food credits. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but does that make sense? No, no, that makes sense. So I think you're hitting on a question that's been a famous and popular and, uh, you know, headline question of does cent per point really matter? Mm -hmm. And I know you made a video about it recently. Mm -hmm. And before we get there, because your favorite card is the Amex Platinum and specifically the Charles Schwab version, Mm -hmm. my question first is, is there any use case for you either today or tomorrow 
to have multiple Amex Platinum cards, which today at the time of recording, they're 695 in their annual fee. They come with all the benefits you mentioned. Mm. But when would that potentially make sense if it does? Um, I would say no. I mean, there was a time where it did hold both. I had the vanilla Platinum and I had a Charles Schwab just because I wanted the Schwab and I got both bonuses, baby. Sorry for everybody. (laughs) Sorry the family language. I know. I don't mean to rub it in, but you know, hundred thousand Charles Schwab. But listen, listen. I only got like sixty k vanilla platinum. You'd laugh that out of the world now, you know. Although back then it was a five fifty annual fee, um, you know. And when you had it, it was you know it was like five dollars. Crazy. You had it like twenty years ago, <laughs> thirty years ago. You had the platinum card before it was released. Um, but <laughs> but um, no, I don't think there's a world where it makes sense. It, I think at that point it's like I think the only people that really benefit from holding multiple platinums. Except for you in the comment section, you just said it makes sense. Um, of people in the military where the annual fee is waived, those are the only people that I've ever heard of holding multiple. Like freaking Wandering Doc has like, he had like five of them. He's like, oh, I have five platinum cards because all the annual fees are waived. So why not have five of them? Because you just get infinite value from them because <laughs> they're all free. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it would make sense. I feel like you're just, I feel like there are diminished returns from all the credits, probably. Mm-hmm. But again, I mean, one might say like, well, if you can value it now, why couldn't you value two? It's just like the same calculations. But again, you're footing a $1,400 bill every year for those benefits. If it's worth it, if it's worth it, I don't know. For me, even at some points, even one platinum might be too much, you know. But for me, no. I think just one, I'm done. <laughs> Fair. For now. So coming back to the cents per point question. But wait, 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 wait. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay. You're going to be grilling me, but wait, let me ask you. You've had a platinum card for longer than I've been alive. Uh, <laughs> why, why, why wouldn't you have multiple of them? Why don't you want two of them? Oh, no, man. Okay. Okay. So first of all, first of all, this is about you, but here we go. So multiple platinums, if I think about it, impromptu in general, I would say one platinum definitely makes sense. If it makes sense, if one makes sense, like great. If it doesn't make sense, then there is no question of multiple platinums. Hmm. If more than one is the case, like let's say two platinums, and let's not overcomplicate it where maybe it's the Morgan Stanley platinum and the Charles Schwab platinum and the Amex vanilla platinum, just if it's like multiple platinums, period, I would say that if you get value from the credits that come with it, then that's great. If that supersedes the annual fee, then it's a no-brainer for the most part. Mm -hmm. There are certain credits where it doesn't really make sense if, and I'm just assuming there's no other player too, there's no other kids, no authorized users, I'm saying just you or like Mm -hmm. one individual. So if I have two Amex platinums, For me, I get a lot of value from Amex Platinum through Walmart Plus, where Mm -hmm. there's a specific Sam's Club near where I live, and they're a gas station because Walmart owns Sam's Club. Basically, yeah, yeah. So basically, I'm getting 25 cents off a gallon because I have the Walmart Plus perk through my Amex Platinum. So instead of getting elevated earned rate on my gas, Mm -hmm. this perk literally saves me way more than that, you know, 3% on, let's say, four bucks a gallon of gas is like 12 cents. Depending on California, I'm sure it's more. But Mm -hmm. if you're saving 25 cents off the bat, and then you get extra cash back. You can only imagine the fact of how much value there is. I'm sorry. Do we have bagpipes going on? <laughs> what the hell is happening here? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? There is. There are bagpipe people. What, the, what is this guy doing? Is it the one bagpiper making all this noise? Oh, my God. Get a load of this high redundancy, folks. Like this. Goodness gracious. The lid is falling out, man. No, man. This is one of the cheapest redemptions, which <laughs> we'll actually get into over here in a second. It was one of the better redemptions and the best redemption of my life for this level of property of 9,000 points a night on a Saturday night, that too. Mm. But coming back to where we were with multiple platinums, Sorry. if you can get the value from one, basically that's great. And if you have value from multiple, I would say it comes down to like, do you value the double credits on the travel credit for the 200 travel credit or having multiple Hilton and Marriott gold status from both cards? That's like an equivalent benefit, which doesn't give that much value. Yeah. So I think there is a use case for sure. Rideshare credits, you know, if that's double of them, great, right? So if one works, it's almost like scalable to if one works, if you can get 100 platinums in theory, that should also give you value if you're consuming or spending that much money. So you see what I'm trying to say? It's like simple math, but yeah. like logical argument. But mm-hmm. anyways... <laughs> cents per point. So this question is basically coming from the fact that where, hey, there's a hotel room and I'm just going to make the examples exorbitant for our explanation. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's a $3,000 a night hotel room. Let's say it costs 300,000 points in whatever currency or for some hotel. In terms of value, yeah, one way to put it is 300k points, let's say is worth one penny per point is $3,000 cash. So actually that's a very equivalent example. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting that much value. 
Yeah. But let's say the same three thousand dollar night is now worth you know costs fifty thousand points. Yeah. That's pretty phenomenal in one way, where the cents per point valuation is like six X, so six cents per point. Yeah. So if you're getting five percent cash back on your card, mm-hmm. each of those points are worth six cents, it's like you're getting thirty percent cash back for the value. Like this is all this math in my head I'm doing. Yeah. Hopefully I'm correct, guys. Comment down below if I'm wrong. But in the the point being mm-hmm. Would you really pay three thousand dollars a night? Is usually what the argument is yeah. of is cents per point. Does it really matter, or like what's really going on here? And for flights, it's the same situation. So I just want to give that example to kick us off. But go for it. Yeah. So luckily, I've I've been able to be educated on this subject by everyone who's ever come on to my podcast. So luckily, a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me. And basically. What I found just by pulling all of their experiences and my own experiences together is that, like most things in life, there is some sort of a middle ground. It's, uh, you know, maybe it's a boring answer, but a lot of people uh, find that, okay, yes, no, I'm not going to be able to get 10 cents per point every single redemption. But I'm also not going to get one cent per point every single redemption. And sometimes it's easy just to get above that. So I think a lot of it is down to, well, do you care? more about less experiences but the perceived higher value in the, all of your points that you're using or vice versa so like for an example my entire life of being in the points of miles game up until like starting youtube i didn't even know what cent per point was i literally i've not heard that term until i got onto youtube and started reading comments and pe- re- watching youtubers and stuff i was like what the hell is cent per point all i ever cared about and pretty much what i still only care about to a degree but i'll 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 tell you why. I've only cared about how can I pay nothing out of pocket. That's all I cared about. How can I spend as little cash out of pocket as possible? And how that looked early on was, well, we really loved Hilton Hotels, my wife and I. So I signed up for Hilton credit cards, got a lot of their points, and I was able to stay for, you know, in in our time years because we weren't vacationing too much. But every single time we went on a vacation, we knew it was covered. Didn't matter what the hotel was. We just wanted to make sure it was close to the destination and in a safe area. So for me, not even having a perspective of cent per point, that meant everything to me and still does mean everything to me that I can go places and pay with points and miles and not have to you know, pull cash out of my pocket. However, I do agree that you need to have a floor for things and, and something that makes a lot of sense. Like, Obviously, not redeeming a chase point under you know under uh, you know one cent per point or an Amex point under point six or something like that. I mean, if you're going point six, you're really struggling. That's like you know that's a horrible. <laughs> you're really doing some bad stuff. But I don't know. I just feel like you know you should have a floor because that's just good math. You know that's just good practices to follow. Good good SOPs. But at the end of the day, I've only really cared about okay. This hotel looks really cool. It's in an area that I really want to stay in and it looks safe, and I love all the amenities, and things are walkable to there. So for me, it's more so about what actually is there at the destination, and not necessarily so much about um, you know doing the calculation first, and like, okay, you know what? That hotel over there, that tapestry, that Hilton tapestry is like three cents per point. It's amazing. You know, obviously, no Hilton's getting three cents per point, but you know, I, like yeah. that hotel, amazing cent per point, but it's like not in the downtown area. It's like far off and I have to drive like 25 minutes to get to the downtown versus this one's like half a cent per point, but it's in the heart of downtown. Still getting some dining credits and I can walk around in the downtown and have a drink and stuff like that and not have to worry about things. So for me, that makes more sense to me and I'll use my points like that versus that. Meanwhile, like cent per point really doesn't mean anything either. Like I had this argument with Sean on the BS podcast. If this hotel is two cents per point today and it could be zero cents per point in like two months from now when the summer hits or it could be inflated and what have you. And I get it. You take the aggregate of all the, the different numbers. But if something could change so often, I mean, obviously I'll take the averages, but do I care that much? The only thing that stays constant is can I have a better experience, you know, at this one place in this good location? So I, I am very much in the middle on it, but I personally, I don't even calculate cents per point until after I do the redemption. I don't even really think about it. So that's that's how I live. And uh, I don't know, do you do the same? Do you calculate before or after? What I think about cents per point is, you know, the matrix? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, basically, it's like the illusion of choice. So kind of what you were saying is you never really knew about it until you knew about it, mm-hmm. like through credit card YouTube or otherwise. So obviously, like you said, there, you know, flow rate matters. You know, if you have, you know, 
any number of points or type of points or whoever's giving you those points and you they tell you hey you can redeem these at one penny a point mm -hmm. if you have a million points that's ten thousand real cold hard cash yeah. dollars and if you use those million points to get a 25 five dollar gift card somewhere someone either scammed you or you got you know kind of screwed over right, right. Yeah. so the point is i do agree with you that cents per point can be overrated for a lot of use cases mm -hmm. in the sense of in the end of the day right like it's are you getting the value right like your example is i'm getting the value i am happy i may be getting double the value 16 miles away from my main destination is that worth it for my own ego or for the math to be like wow i did a great job i maximized this equation on paper mm -hmm. but if I may be a little crass, points are made up like money. It's not a real system. It's, mm -hmm. it's just numbers on the screen, if we're being real. So at the same time, these algorithms or Hiltons or Marriott's or whoever, Chase, they could just say tomorrow, hey, all these points, we're going to change all our rules. You may be sitting on a million points, and all of these are now going to be worth 0 0.25 cents per point. So yeah. a 75% reduction value. So mm -hmm. coming to the more headline of this question, I would say I love to acknowledge for my own maximization purposes, hey, did I get a good cent per point value? Did I not waste my points in a certain manner? Mm -hmm. But the efficacy, or in other words, what you want of where you're spending your cash mm -hmm. to actually get you what you want, points and cash are no different in terms of the utility. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be meant for getting what you want. Mm -hmm. So as long as you got what you want, and, and it's all reasonable, right? You didn't overspend, you didn't underspend, that kind of, there's a range of your acceptable parameters of, am I okay with this decision or not? Yeah. And if you are, move on to the next decision. So I know that's very straightforward, but... I just how I think about it is like the minutia really mattered similar to when you have less, you have those few things in front of you. In other words, there's a saying when a person is broke or doesn't have any money, they have only one problem. They literally have no money. Mm -hmm. And there's an expression, a person with a million dollars has a million problems because mm -hmm. then they're managing whatever they are to create that stream of revenue or have it or maintain it, whatever, protect yeah. it. So in the same vein, I used to care a lot about this sense per point. And what I'm getting at is I feel this question comes from not a scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. but it comes from, hey, I have X amount of points and I'm trying to maximize them. The question is, why do you only have X? Why do you not have X plus Y or X times two or X squared? Mm -hmm. In other words, how do you get more points in general? In other words, are you, I'm not saying go spend more to get them, right? I'm not saying go sign up for a bunch of credit cards to get more. I'm really saying in general, if you shift your mind into how do I get, how much value can I squeeze out of what's in front of me? If you phrase it as the opposite mm -hmm. way is there's so much value anyways to be gotten. How many points do I need for what I want? Okay, how do I get it? What yeah. can I do? What's the next step? Et cetera, et cetera. So I know that became a little philosophical there, but I think it's just that type of thinking is what I would say personally. Well, do you, you know, it, so I guess bridging off that, there is a mindset in the, you know, the financial world when you're making money as well. When you watch some videos about saving money, you'll always have a comment saying, why save, just earn more. Yeah. So do you think that works in the, the points of miles game too? Like, why am I worried about, I guess, maybe saving or maximizing the points I have? Or is it like, oh, should you just earn more? How that looks is different to everybody. Like, am I spending, you know, 10000 a month? Uh, I sure am not, <laughs> you know, but, or could I sign up for more cards and be more strategic or hopefully have some friends and family you can refer to? Um, <laughs> so do you think that mindset kind of works like just earn more points versus, uh, you know, uh, maximizing what you have? Yeah, I think it comes down to how you earn these points, right? So if you're actually overspending, if you're actually just applying to get something which isn't sensible in year two, and if you're just kind of short-term navigating this whole situation, mm. it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm. At the same time, 50 years ago, uh, and this is not like actual mathematical or like scientific or historic, like yeah. a data point, but 50 plus years ago, I'm pretty sure we didn't have credit cards. Um, and I'll just bump up the example a hundred years ago. Sure. So like fast forward, like now we have all of these systems and all of these, you know, kind of processes to get X, Y, Z and like, you know, do all these things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is we can change our habits to get what we want today. But if we just spend more a hundred years ago, when there's no system of credit card points and all, it's just a guy or a person who's just spending money. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really trying to say is it's almost like my, I guess, philosophy or whatever here is if you just live neutrally, how you were going to do it anyways, if credit cards didn't exist, mm -hmm. now you can just use that as a way to funnel more spend through these things called cards, like credit yeah. cards, to get whatever it can kind of give you back yeah. in terms of that cash back or points. Yeah. But if you just want to like earn more or you're trying to do some short-term navigations to do it, if it makes sense, right? Each person is called personal finance for a reason. Uh, but if you're just getting points to hoard them and never spend them and just have like, oh, I have 10 million points, guys, look at me. Um, 
good for you, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I answered that question appropriately, but it's almost saying in one simple bullet, if you are doing that next step for like a reason that doesn't matter two years from now, you know, it shouldn't really matter. So if it's like a lifetime vacation, a once in a lifetime kind of feeling and all these things, yeah, maybe it's worth it. Maybe, right. It just depends. But if you're just going to do this and next year you're going to figure out another way, okay, how do I spend more to get more? It's like, that's very illogical. Um, you know, uh, there's always caveats in these things, but Mm -hmm. generally speaking is, this is what I would think. It's interesting. That's very interesting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm going to switch it up a little because I know you mentioned your wife. So with your wife, I'll call it the player two game, basically. When we have two players, and everyone who's watching this probably is aware, like there's yourself, and then maybe you have a P2. In other words, they're opening up the same cards to have that double the sign-up bonus, double the benefits, uh, or just a strategic mix of, hey, your card and my card equal something better, like one plus one equals three, like synergy. (laughs) So (laughs) the question for you is, you having your wife, what's your kind of overall experience uh, if there's been any, you know, synergy in the first place or how you've done things and then we'll drill down. Yeah. So at least for her, well, I, I think the, the main issue a lot of people have is like, how do I get my significant other, my player two, um, into the game? And, you know, I've, I've talked about it on videos and stuff and a lot of it is just leading by example. It's like, okay, I showed her that I was able to get my first credit card and build up my credit score over the course of a few months. And then she was had the confidence to get over biases towards credit cards and debt and all that stuff and just open up her own, you know, secured credit card to, to build up her credit. So she followed that. Then afterwards, I started learning from the likes of, you know, Graham and whatnot and just talking about points and miles and how you can sign up for certain cards for their points. Happen to be, you know, um, you know, some Capital One cards, happen to be some Amex cards and, you know, Hilton cards and what have you. Um, and then using that for the vacation. So once she started seeing like, oh, we're not paying for hotels anymore. Um, in, uh, you know, I guess flights were flight, flights weren't during that time. We were more driving everywhere, but not paying for hotels anymore. She was like, okay, so he's doing that. And this is what we're doing. Okay. So maybe I can do the same thing. So I think a lot of it is just showing people showing first, showing the, the value of it. And then the rest is kind of history, unless they have underlying issues, like they can't handle debt. They have debt and they can't handle credit cards, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, as far as like stories are concerned, I mean, now she's all in, in the game. She's like, okay, you know, we, we, literally this is some of the most amazing stays, like the, you know, things we w- would have dreamed of when we were, um, you know, growing up, like I was staying at places that are like motel six equivalents, basically roadway ins, um, and, uh, you know, like days in and some of these places. So, you know, having to stay at like some, like, luxury <laughs> category at least now you know we're getting fancy category five hyatts you know that's high <laughs> not quite eight yeah, not yeah. eight yet but well you know category five it's opened her eyes to just what's possible so now if we're not spending towards anything she'll literally ask me like is there a card like i need to open that we could put spend towards and that's why she just got the chasing cash baby um and uh, so this way we're always putting some spend just normal spend onto these cards. This way we can just keep running the game and getting more awesome vacations, you know? And so, so she's a full, she's full on in. She doesn't really care about the game uh, like that, like how we do, but she just like wants to constantly, like, like she's in it to get more cards and to get more experiences. Cause she knows like now she has over 10 credit cards and an 800 credit score. So like she knows there's no real risk for her specific because she's good with money and all that stuff. Yeah. Dang, that's pretty cool because uh, I like how you went through the origin story, the kind of the problem statement, kind of what you did. You guys grew together. That's mm-hmm. pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, you're obviously here and she's there fueling the fire basically is what how I hear it. So, yeah, yeah that's sick. She better. No. <laughs> <laughs> Man. <laughs> Ridiculous. Overall, it seems like it's pretty seamless. Can I touch your hair? What the <laughs> hell? Like, <laughs> So, um, we threw them off, baby. But- man, so what I was saying was okay. <laughs> everything was seamless with what you just said with your player, too. Yeah. And now that I'm back on track with my question and what I'm about to ask you, has there been any frustrations, though, any negative points, something uh, I can learn from personally, we can share, uh, so everyone can learn together here? Um, nothing necessarily. Can I touch your hair? <laughs> no, 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 go for it. Go for it. Um, no, nothing. <laughs> nothing necessarily negative inherently. There's just been times where it's like, oh, an annual fee hits, and she's like, oh, because I mean, uh, it's kind of controversial. But 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 some folks who are in this game who get their player two in the game, they manage all their annual fees. Like I would pay all the annual fees for her. Mm. I don't really agree with that. I mean, if she's going to be benefiting and, and getting in on the game, you could 
take a couple annual fees like I am, all right? If she's in it, she's in it. And I think if she's in it and paying the annual fees, well, one, she keeps more track of it. So if she decides that's not worth it, we could talk about it. And two, well, you know, uh, there's a mutual respect there. Because if you're just paying all the annual fees, she doesn't even realize that that's even happening. Like, I don't even think she realizes, like, there's, like, a thousand, like, a thousand dollars in annual fees I'm paying and stuff like that. So I think when she's paying a little bit, like, she's paying, like, maybe 180 right now a year. You, there's a little bit of a mutual respect that even on a, even though it's like, <laughs> this is nothing that crazy credit cards and stuff, but it is kind of life changing. But even on this scale, there's like mutual respect in the battlefield that you're both paying your own respective annual fees so that you can both enjoy those awesome vacations down the line. Um, although having said that, a lot of the, her cards are, you know, to have annual fees, she doesn't need to have any more. So we'll probably cancel, but um, that just depends on everyone's situation. But, um, no, uh, other than that, no real frustrations because the, I I go over everything prior to. I like this is the fee, this is what we're gonna get, and here's the game plan. Like when we'll cancel it or if we're gonna keep it, you know, forever, whatever. So she's well aware prior to getting any of the cards, you know. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I feel like uh, y'all uh, seems like in your situation, you use points and miles for more hotel stays. Yeah. And when it comes to like airlines, have there been times where maybe you have the platinum, for example, where you get clear plus, so you have a little quicker line, hopefully for mm-hmm. TSA pre, uh, TSA security check in general. And maybe she doesn't. And in my situation, that's happened, uh, oh. in, you know, infinity times. But that's also my choice to literally just make her an authorized user, right? Yeah. Or she has her own uh, Amex Platinum. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to ask you if any something similar, like airport wise, for y'all. So what I do is this is what this is what any good husband. So if you're listening and you're about to get married or you will be married, if you're a good husband, what you want to do is, and I learned this from Chad Money Minutes and Loose Points and Miles, the best thing to do and the most romantic thing is to book a first class ticket and then let them sit in economy. That's the most romantic <laughs> thing you could. <laughs> That is what you – and also when you go to Centurion lounges, walk into the Centurion lounge, flash your platinum, let go on through, and then your wife and kids, you know, they sit out in the outside and they sit in like the little – you know, the little high chairs they give you when they're outside the Centurion lounge before you get in. You, know, you let them sit out there because, you know, you're not going to pay $50. I mean, come on. You know, if they want to give you an authorized, you let them pay for it. <laughs> no, but seriously <laughs> – but seriously, no, I do foot the bills for the Centurion Lounge and stuff. That shouldn't pay for. Unless it's like Delta Sky Club where they're not really they're not really watching you. you know, just sneak her past. You know. Sorry. Sorry the whatever his name was. Um <laughs> He was like, put two. Make sure you put two on there that you're going through the sky lounge. I said, Yeah. <laughs> and then we're gone. Anyway. But for clear, no, actually we signed up for clear uh I got her on together because for some reason I guess there was a deal, I guess it's normal. But the platinum card comes with the the clear credit up to what one eighty nine I think it is. Mm-hmm. Um but the deal was you can have two people, uh I think it was like one forty nine for me and then forty to add her on. Okay, so I think gotcha. it was one eight so it was perfect, completely for free. So she got clear and we did the whole biometric scanning and whatnot actually in Vegas before we came back home. And it's, they set it up pretty quick. It was maybe like, uh, I don't know if you guys did it or you did it, but it was like uh, maybe 15 minutes total between yeah. us two. Very, very fast. And they have crazy questions. They answer, they ask questions that are like, like only, yeah, like the only the government knows. I guess maybe it's the agency and whatnot, but like, like who is this, you know, distant great aunt? You know, how, like, how do you, I don't even know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was really easy, and then that got us through to the TSA line pretty pretty quickly. And there was actually a funny story with that. Very quick, but we went through the TSA line, <laughs> and she and my my wife's like, "Only you would do something like this, whatever." But I went through the TSA line, and uh, I was I think I had just a water bottle. I f- maybe we got it from a lounge or something. I forget, but I think I had a water bottle, and he was like. Uh, the TSA agent was like, looked at me. He was like, he said, you got to dump that out. That's alcohol, right? I, <laughs> and I said, it was just a normal water bottle. So I could tell just he was being kind of funny. So I said, oh, no, I mean, listen, if you want some shots, <laughs> I'll <laughs> offer it to you. And then my wife was like, you can't offer a TSA agent shots of alcohol. <laughs> I was like, that it wasn't actually, it was just water. I said, no, it's just water, obviously. He's like, I'm just playing with you. Um, so it was like a funny one-off <laughs> thing. And then we went on our way, you know. And uh, we got we got on the flight. And we left. <laughs> no, that's cool, man. And uh, yeah, this um, 
a fun fact, I guess, for us, um, if anyone knows or not, but the questions you got, those like, oh, like only stuff you would know. Uh, it's something called like KBA, like knowledge-based, I think, answers or mm. knowledge-based uh, something. Yeah. So um, I do remember those questions too. And the funny thing is like, uh, it's not that funny, but like if you literally don't know the answers, like they're like, you're not you, but it's like, dude, like, no, it's me. <laughs> like, yes. how do you know these things about, but like, obviously I get it, right? But yeah. Or if you moved around a lot or something, yeah. or if you have multiple addresses that overlap or something and you pick the wrong one, like, it's like, you're not you. So mm -hmm. anyways. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know where my parents, my parents, like, first house address. Why would I know that? But I think I got something like that once. You know? yeah, yeah. It's like, what the hell? No, for real. So, <laughs> all right. So when it comes to credit cards, we're talking about, let's say, your typical basic example. Oh, hey, you're getting cash back. 2% per dollar spent, 1% per dollar spent. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are more in the money making business, uh, I'm just generalizing versus maybe the saver mindset. Mm -hmm. They look at credit cards like, dude, like, what are you trying to do here where you get, you spend a hundred grand and if you get 2% back, oh, good for you. You got 2000 bucks after spending a hundred K. Mm -hmm. And they look at it like, oh, sign up bonuses up 200 bucks back after 500 spend. Yeah, it's 40%, but who cares? It's still 200 bucks in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a uh, whole other side. I'll call them the making money mindset versus saver mindset. So they look at credit cards like a waste of time. They don't make money. Uh, also, you have the downside risk of getting into debt if you have bad tendencies and otherwise. But apart from the truly negative side, mm -hmm. for more of like people that are trying to maximize their points and miles, the fun question I wanted to have with you today, one of them at least, is what is like the maximum lifetime value? However you want to calculate that. doesn't mean super mathematical, but like at a high level, what is this quote unquote hobby, passion, way of life? What is this truly worth maybe to the average individual or mm. any other detail you want to add in your opinion? And we can go back and forth together. Huh? So that is very interesting. Yeah, that is an interesting question. Because the, the first thing I think of to your first point, like the people who earn a lot, and I've met a lot of those people in the real estate world. And they're like, what's the point of credit cards? You know, I'm just, I'm earning too much, you know, <laughs> and I get it. And I think there probably is a limit. I don't know what that range actually would be. My guess it would probably be like around a half a million a year. Like an income is when you, like it, it would, like you would lose more money trying to maximize with credit cards somehow than, uh, than it's worth at least mentally they would think of unless you've been growing with credit cards until you hit that kind of income. I think probably what it is for you. you say? Yeah. I was just going to say, it sounds like kind of the opportunity cost of their time spent yeah. to maximize here. They could be making more money with the time saved to spend it somewhere to make more yeah. money. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, like, if you do follow some of the folks in the community and stuff and some of the redemptions they're able to do, especially if you're becoming that high earner or high net worth individual, usually you're upping your lifestyle inflation as well, right? So you're maybe you're booking more business classes or more first classes. And that quickly adds up. So I think there's like a, a threshold to, to what makes sense. Like you, you can, I mean, there's a bunch of people on YouTube who've booked like these crazy high level flights that were worth like $20,000 and to a high net with a worth individual, they would pay that. So like, well, to what degree would that make sense to like use your Amex points that you earn through maybe a business platinum spend for that $20,000 first class flight to wherever, um, because that's, I mean, listen, if you're making half a million a year saving on a 25 K flight, um, just from the points you earn through just like a measly 15 K spend, which that business is probably spending way more. Um, like the, I think that's still substantial. I mean, that's what, you know, 25, what 20, that's uh, like 20% uh, percent of your income that technically was saved just yeah. via points and miles, of course, paying annual fees, whatever. So I'm like, I wonder what that limit is on how much you have to earn before whatever that benefit of that first class flight or five star hotel is actually worth uh, saving to you. And I think probably the flights are the biggest thing. Like there's no real hotels that you're spending, spending 20,000 on. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it could be if you're staying for weeks and weeks and really high level places, of course. Um, but I think the, the flights is probably what they're doing, but maybe they're just making money and they're just business owners and they're doing nothing else, but in their area, then sure. Maybe it doesn't make sense. I'm just going to keep working and working. But I just, I, on that first point, I feel like there's gotta be a limit to how much someone earns to where the opportunity cost doesn't make sense. But I mean, I wouldn't be so, I, I guess there's a reason like Graham Stephan doesn't really, I doubt he's still opening up credit card. Plus he's also got a lot of them. So maybe that's why, but I feel like he doesn't open up as many cards as maybe as he once did. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. He, he talks about how, um, he doesn't open up bank account bonuses anymore yeah. or like credit cards is not as focused anymore. And I think we probably both agree on this point. 
and maybe you've said it a different way, is that for me, it's like not how much you earn, but really coming down to how much you're willing to spend. Yeah. And like with, you know, chances are if you're spending more, you're earning more. And I think that spending, if it becomes normalized for you, if you're never going to go one tranche down, in other words, if you, now your lifestyle is business class flights only, mm -hmm. now your lifestyle is first class flight only, like, you know, some people are like, I never fly coach, right? Like economy, not for me, yes. you know? So <laughs> the point is, if that is your, who you are, mm -hmm. then that technically means there is, let's say value. And if you're spending like your example, 20 K for a flight, um, if you're getting five X with Amex platinum, your example, that's a hundred thousand points. That is the same number of points, most likely depending on the redemption, yeah. you can also get that same that's flight. True. So it's like a buy one, get one free, but, yeah. but is it really, but maybe they were willing to spend 20 K yeah. and they may not be thinking about it, but really they only spent technically 10 K, 10 K. If you see where I'm trying to come yeah. from, yeah. um, but I, uh, I agree with what you're saying uh, in general. Um, yeah. It's probably a limit. It's probably a yeah. uh, limit. So what makes sense for them and yeah, their lifestyle yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. So I will say this. The question I asked you actually was, Sorry. what is the no, it's okay. What is the max okay. lifetime value that someone can benefit? So in other words, let's say I'll use an example of myself and then uh, we'll keep it going. Yeah. So, so far I've earned over $100,000 of value from my uh you know, 50 plus credit cards that I have. Now, what does that really mean? That means, was I really going to spend $100,000 worth of travel with the same points, like the value conversion? Yeah. So again, yes and no, right? The point is I got that much value. And did mm -hmm. I travel more because I had more points or more the optionality to do it? So I definitely did it more. Yeah. So if there was no concept of points and miles, I'm, I'm telling you now, I'm not, I wouldn't have spent that much yeah. in general. So there, there are like two sides of the coin. And so what I'm trying to ask here is, apart from all the bonuses you can get, like even if you're spending $100,000 for the next 30 years, that's three mil, 2% of three mil is $60,000, like cold hard cash. So maybe the value um, I'm just surmising is maybe 60K plus all these acquisition bonuses. So maybe like 200K or something, but I'm sure there's other like benefits. And yeah, if you're like a credit card YouTuber and all these things and referrals, that's different. You're like earning from a, a different venture from the main uh, you know, card setup, but that's kind of where my mentality was and wanted to hear if you had any thoughts on what I was just saying. Yeah. So I think it's a really interesting question and probably more philosophical than anything is like, what, yeah, what is the max value and value can mean different things. When you hear that, you might think dollar value or you might think experience in my opinion. And whenever I've heard the argument of like, yes, you wouldn't have spent $20,000 on a flight, uh, you know, that you got 10 cent per point on every time I hear that it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to me because my only response to that is like, yes, no, I would not have bought that, but I also would have a less fulfilled, less experienced life <laughs> if yeah. I didn't have points of miles. So it's like, I use the points of miles to experience things I couldn't normally do and period. <laughs> like, and I don't think there has to be any type of judgment on that whatsoever. And I think the max lifetime value is, okay, how many different experiences or even how many more experiences have you had than you know, your next door neighbor who's trying to pay cash for all these vacations. Meanwhile, you were able to take, you know, six in one year because for some reason it was a fruitful year for points, right? So it's like, um, I, I don't necessarily agree that like the max lifetime value is a dollar amount, but I think when you look back on yourself, maybe 20 years from now, you might say like, wow, we went to, you know, 30 countries, you know, we were able to experience all of that. And if you really put the math to that, you're like, okay, had I only used my, you know, post-tax income, maybe we would have went to like three countries, you know, five countries, which I think that number probably is pretty accurate for how powerful points and miles could be. So it's like if I had 10x the amount of experiences over my lifetime, then I don't care what the dollar amount. I just care that I experience those things that people would dream of. So I don't know. Max lifetime value is how many different things were you able to do in your life? Probably compared to the average, you know? Yeah. No, no. I actually, I love your answer. The fact that you're not actually spending cold, hard cash for these experiences and you're having a fruitful slash bountiful amount, yeah. it's that you're getting more overall value apart from the dollar perspective. And the cool thing is you're probably going to make more dollars all else equal because if you invest that difference that you would have spent on the same travel experiences, then interestingly enough, like whether you say compound interest or, you know, having the capability to save for a down payment mm -hmm. because you weren't spending it on travel, but you're still getting the experiences. What I've noticed is that when you travel from 
place to place. And maybe because, again, we're in America, so it's a little different. Mm -hmm. Switzerland is super expensive day to day for, let's say, our currency. But generally speaking, once you can get the place to either just get there in the first place, mm -hmm. and even if you're staying there too, it's pretty much like if you eat out every day, for example, or in general, day to day, then you're basically doing the same thing elsewhere. And depending where you go, it's either equal or a little more, or a little less. Yeah. But if you see where I'm coming from, it's really like you're able to save the bulk of that expense and you can deploy that capital however you please. So that I, I'm just realizing like that's a great point you brought up and uh, hmm. wanted to segue it this way. Yeah. And so coming to more money-focused questions, mm -hmm. let's get into it. Sure. What does money mean to you? Hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we've talked about this off camera and, and whatnot uh, while we were hanging out, but money to me, at, really at its core, and maybe this is just stemming from my upbringing and, uh, you know, just, uh, I don't know, having a bit of a scarcity mindset. For me, money always meant security. So as long as I had enough money, I could pretty much do whatever I want and I have the freedom to do whatever I want, you know, in life. So it's like X amount of dollars means maybe, uh, it for, might mean different things to different people. Some people might call it an emergency fund, whereas like maybe you have to pay rent with no job for the next six months or, you know, one year. Or maybe you have emergency fund for, you know, groceries in case you can't pay for them for the whole year. So I think it can mean something for different people. For me, money always meant as long as I can have enough of it, hopefully over time, then I think 99% of my worries would pretty much go away, like of, of things collapsing, things being destroyed, uh, you know, even just relationship problems when you got to pay for rent or you have to pay for kids and you have money loom, you know, money problems looming. I think if you have enough, have that security blanket, I think that's when you get kind of true freedom. So for me, I think it's money equals security. Money equals security. Makes sense. Uh, I do agree with you and uh, similar kind of feelings about everything you said. Hmm. I would ask you then in that case, what is the most kind of beneficial outcome? And it may sound obvious, but what is the most beneficial outcome that money has played in your life? And what is probably, you know, maybe a negative side of money that you've noticed, whether systemically, but again, like related to you in your personal experience? Something maybe to share that, again, we can learn from mutually. Hmm. Well, so I guess going back, having this mindset of like every dollar is probably the last and, you know, you have to work so hard for your money. So you want to save as much as possible. Having that mindset, and this was like pre Graham Stephanie wasn't even on YouTube yet when I was starting to talk about, you know, think about all these things. I remember being, I remember being about maybe 17 and, uh, well, actually even earlier, 14, <laughs> I remember being like 14 and having a paper route and earning at least at that time when the paper was like still making money before the internet kind of ruined everything. Um, <laughs> it ruined, ruined everything. The, <laughs> I know, that's right. Ruined the paper industry, like the newspaper, right, which right. I mean, honestly, it should just, you know, forget it. But, um, I was making like, that's funny. I was making like, I think $300 net profit every, no, no, I think I was making like, I think I was making about $300, three to $400 every single month net profit from 14 years old till 19 when I gave up the paper out because over over time, the internet kind of destroyed the newspaper industry, at least in New York. And, um, you know, the, the paper company I was delivering for, eventually the prices of paper went up, but the consumers were paying the exact same amount. So my profit margins went to like, I ended up only making like $50 a month at one point. And that's when I said, this is not even worth it anymore. Like, If I may ask, like you say net profit. So I'm thinking about like Warren Buffett back in the day where it's like, oh, every paper delivery is getting X amount times number of houses. That's his earnings. But when you're saying net profit, are you buying the paper and selling it or? Yeah. So, so how it worked for that, that company and for a lot of paper route companies is you'll buy the papers from the company and you deliver them to the people who are subscribed to the company. And then I go and collect the money from the people on the street. Mm -hmm. So every Sunday, you know, 14 years old high school, when I didn't even know how to talk to anybody, had to go up to all these houses and be like, um, you owe for a week, you know? <laughs> and it's like, okay, you owe, uh, I forgot what it was. I think it might've been, uh, five, I think it was like maybe $7 a week for the Thursday, Sunday paper and $12 a week for the seven day paper. I think it was like, you know, cause the, cause the Thursday and Sunday paper had the coupons. So like, if you want to max out your Burger King coupons, man, you get the Sunday Thursday paper for $7 and usually you save enough. So I used to, you know, sometimes I would steal the, <laughs> 
<laughs> Sometimes I would steal the Burger King coupons or we'd get yeah. extra papers and I would take all the Burger King. You know, you love Burger King. So, but it's like buy one, get one chicken sandwiches and stuff. Like, that's good savings. Yeah, right, have it your way, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Have it your way. Steal it. No, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, no. So the paper route was, um, was, that's, that was the model, basically. And there was a couple times they wanted me to sell to like new people on the street, but nobody wanted to buy the paper. Like, yeah. nobody cared about it. I know I'm uh, probably seg- tangent. Uh, it's yeah. a tangential question, but like I would love to hear how at 14 years old you're interacting with what sounds like it's like cold door knocking, but to some degree, right? You do have a relation to have a relation with the actual company. You're like a broker in the middle, and did that have any kind of um, you know everlasting effects and uh, all the things? Like I have something in my head, but I I love to hear uh, maybe extra detail from you. Yeah, no, that's great. That's that's because awesome, I haven't had to think about this in a long time. So there's a few things having a paper route teaches you, um, and I actually think that it's one of the most important jobs to have early on. Um, really because, well, when you have a paper out, you realize that nothing matters other than delivering that paper to the people. Nothing else matters. You work 365 days a year, seven days a week, whether it's rain or shine. You ever seen those papers back in the day, rain or shine, we're going to deliver? Um, that's quite legit, really legit, legit. And especially in New York, I remember delivering in zero degree weather with, you know, two feet of snow. And I'm literally up to my knees And I'm like, I wrap up the paper and I deliver it there. So it really gives you a bit of grit that you know every day after school you need to go and deliver those papers no matter what. There's no exceptions. You cannot take off at seven days a week no matter what. Um, Rain or shine again, even if it's really hot too, like 100 100 degree weather, you're going to have to do it. So it forces you to do that. And I think it's a good skill that carries on for a lot of life. You realize like you can't complain about anything. This, these things need to get done. So do it, you know, and in a timely manner too, because if you don't deliver it on time, people are upset. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of times I delivered like 9 PM and be like, what the hell? 9 PM paper. <laughs> it's already the next day. All right. The news is, is late now, you know, so, um, it, it forces you to be punctual and, and also you're beholden to the people because yes, they need you to give you give them the news on time so like every day after school 3 p.m they're they're getting their paper and they have that expectation so if you're later you're gonna see some looks or you're gonna have some issues because they will say like you know you mind delivering a little earlier nobody's really rude but they're like they're like can you have it a little earlier you know because they want their paper a lot of them are the elderly too and they that's where they get a lot of their information um from so i would say paper out is, is an important job to have it's important hustle then you also learn, like you said, sometimes door knocking, which I didn't do very often. I didn't like it because I knew they just didn't want to buy it. So I was like, why am I even going to try and sell it? Um, <laughs> but maybe I could have sold it if I, you know, whatever. But but also what I learned was and something I still to this day uh, kind of not struggle with, but I never really cared necessarily. Like, I don't know, like I remember working jobs and like, oh, your check is ready on Friday. And I just would never pick it up. I would, I would just like wait for my, like the time it took me to go and pick up the check wasn't working worth it even though i worked all those hours to get the 150 dollar paycheck it just wasn't work that i just said i'll just pick it up in like a month I'll do it monthly or something this is what you think when you're so young um but one thing it forced me to do is to be on time every single week but a lot of times i would let it go weeks and weeks and weeks and people would be upset because they have to pay for like four weeks and they're paying like 80 you know 80 dollars sometimes or like for like over a month so it, it does force you to be like okay every week i need to collect the money too so i do the work and at the end of the month i collect the money and it forces you to be good with people because, well, all different backgrounds, all different ages, you're knocking, you're ringing the doorbell and the people answer. And they could be, some of them were nasty. You're know, like, oh, I got to pay again. <laughs> or they're just, you know, maybe they, maybe you need change. So you have to be good with money because you have to dish out whatever the change is. Or just sometimes they crack a joke and you have to be, you know, funny with them or something like that. And, you know, I think it just teaches you to be good with people as well. And if you're really good, paper boy, and you deliver, in, in learning preferences of other people's, I think a lot of it is is learning to serve others. It's a great. It sounds like nothing, but really to serve others is a huge important part in life. And what I learned was a lot of people had preferences. Some of them wanted to have it on the doorstep. Some of them under the doorstep. Some of them in the mailbox. Some of them only mailbox, no matter what. So it's like you realize this about those people, and then you do it. And when they're happy, they will sometimes tip you. So when you go to pay my $7 from a Thursday Sunday, I might get 10, you know, they might give me a $3 tip and that's all cash profit. 
Um, and then around holidays, you get bonuses sometimes. They'll be like, here's a 25, you know, gift card for you, you know, something like that. Cause you were a good paper boy all those years. So it's, uh, it's a good business, but, and I think it teaches you a lot, but I don't think it's, I don't know if it's feasible anymore, to be honest. I don't know who's profiting anymore from it. <laughs> what, what do you think before we move on to more pure money questions? Mm-hmm. And I love hearing these type of stories because it kind of is a foundation to where we can also see where you are today and where mm-hmm. you are to be. What's maybe the today's equivalent of someone who's, whether a teenager or in their young 20s or willing to hustle uh, in general, period, it doesn't matter about age, but like their situation, what is today's paper delivery hustle? Mm. And I'm asking this because if you study Warren Buffett, that's basically was the way he was uh, amassing capital apart from selling candy in school and things. And I always wondered, man, Warren Buffett did it back then. What can I do today? Uh, and I always struggled with it. Like apart from DoorDash, Uber Eats, maybe that's mm. semi-similar. But what maybe in your eyes today is that hustle or where can someone learn these type of skills or values as well? Well, I guess two things come to mind. And, and the first one I'll say, I would say is the most applicable. Well, I guess it depends how old you are. So like if you are 18 and over, I would probably say real estate agent's good, even though I haven't done it very long. A lot of the same principles applies, like being accountable, showing up on time, being punctual, door knocking, meeting people, being good with people and using that for leverage as in like befriending people or, you know, it's not manipulation, but it's just being a likable person, being somebody that you would want to even be around, you know, normally and using that to leverage a relationship with this person. So this way you can hopefully sell their house and provide them more value. Um, but that's the main thing is just providing value through either if it's paper boy, being punctual and being on time or a real estate agent, just being super knowledgeable about something or, you know, getting places early or doing a lot of the research. So I think if you're like 18, I really, I mean, now it's cliche on YouTube because everybody wants to be a real estate agent, but I, uh, I think a lot of the same principles that applied when I was a paper boy do apply as a real estate agent. Um, with a little bit more <laughs> strenuous uh, activity with, with real estate. Cause you're, you know, there's a lot more anal- analyzation and, and dealing with a lot more temperaments of people's personalities. But I think a lot of that teaches you how to, how to do a lot of that stuff. Otherwise, um, if you're really young, I don't know if you're like 14, all the values that you learn from Paperboy. I mean, there's a lot of door to door sales that they'll let you do at 14. Uh, I'm not necessarily certain of what those might be, but I think there are some companies where you can do that type of type of deal. But I mean, you can really do anything. I mean, look, I made some money shoveling driveways, you know, when it, when it snowed out, that's a good way to make a few, you know, maybe even like a few thousand dollars if you do it right and you're really efficient and you, you get the right tools and stuff. But you know, anything you could possibly sell in life. There was a time where I was 14, 15 and I wanted a business where I um, could prepackage food and stuff like um, chicken and rice and vegetables. And I could put it all on a package and pre-make these and, and keep them in a freezer in my house. And this way people can have their meals completely prepped for them. This was like taboo at the time. And then a couple of years later we had like, I forgot the actual, I forget it was like a New York chef something. I, I forgot what it was. And, but like all these like factor meals and all these, it was like before all that. And I was like, okay, that would be cool if, you know, you can, uh, you know, prepackage them and then just sell them like that. But I realized like that that's a lot of <laughs> hard work to kind of do. And I was worried about my own life. Um, but I think anything that you might be able to provide value for, whether it's like raking leaves or, you know, shoveling snow, if you're in the North or, you know, cleaning driveways, you know, walking dogs. I mean, there's, there is a service you can provide at 14 years old that either people don't realize is a service, but you can put it to their forefront just by door knocking. And I think by doing that, even if you get zero sales, you learn how to get rejected by people. You learn how to flow with whatever type of person opens that door, whether nasty or happy, you can jive with it all and you can play it all off and just become a more likable person overall. And I think that helps you with all avenues in life. So I don't know if there's any one job that can do that uh, nowadays that that is so uh, similar, but otherwise I think YouTube is also a great thing. I mean, not everyone can be a YouTuber, but even if you make no money from YouTube, just the skills you learn just by, I don't know, just setting up a camera and being able to talk to a camera, listening to the comments section and seeing if you were bit wrong about something or right about something or you do weird ticks on camera and you learn that over time i think there's a lot of different things you can learn just by filming yourself and putting it out to the world because the world has a good way of telling you if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing so i think that also can help in serving others you know and whatever skill that you learn in life just push it out to the world you know I don't know if that answers the question, but no, man, no, I love it. So coming back to the fact that you're basically an agent, 
my question is, you know, we talk about credit cards and all these things on YouTube and, you know, things may change about what we talk online as long as we're providing value, then that's all that matters in the longer mm-hmm. term, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. What I want to ask you is when it comes to the whole process of being approved for a loan, my understanding is you basically go through, let's say, a mortgage broker if you're trying to buy uh, some XYZ property. So in that process, there's maybe, you know, then appraiser and the whole system of buying a property. There's someone who's maybe doing other forms of due diligence. Maybe there's a mortgage broker who's approving a loan or like dealing with another company to get you an approval. Maybe pre-approval to see how much you qualify for. You have the actual real estate agent part. Mm. And so my question to you is simply put, if you're talking about credit cards and numbers kind of, or you know, financial figures online, my assumption would be potentially someone who's an agent may either gravitate towards a mortgage broker situation where you're asking people, hey, what are the assets you have? How much is your income? What are the other numerical figures you need to collect such that you can inform them about, hey, this is your essentially credit line. In other words, how much loan you qualify for. So I want to ask you, how come real estate versus maybe a mortgage broker? Or maybe I'm phrasing the question entirely uh, incorrectly such that maybe you could be both. Maybe you could be your own real estate brokerage shop where you have all these services under one roof. So I'm expanding the example, but just want to hear kind of if I'm thinking about that line of thought correctly, or maybe it's totally independent and totally different reasoning. So Yeah. So I, I believe you can do both. You, you can have it, have it all agent and broker, I, I, I think. Um, but um, no, I mean, I guess for me, it's just like, I didn't have anyone on YouTube like Graham Stephan or me, Kevin telling me to be a mortgage broker. <laughs> I never, I, I never really had that. I was just like, okay, uh, from what I understand, I think there's schooling involved or there's like really hard tests and stuff for mortgage brokering. Like it's a lot. Like I believe it's like way more strenuous than most tests from what I hear from the folks who've done it. Um, but from what I've learned online, it was just real estate agent was, well, really no barrier to entry, just high school, you know, you just, just graduate high school. And of course you have to study hard and you have to pass the test, which depending on your state can be very, very hard. This state's decent. And I actually, I failed the state exam the first time I took the real estate exam, passed the national and then a week later, I passed both. So, you know, but <laughs> I studied really hard and I still failed that state. So it's like, it's a hard test. Um, but I think this the lower barrier to entry plus the influences of YouTube um, over time has led me to be a real estate agent versus mortgage broker. Yeah, there is some tie in. Um, however, I, I think probably being on the mortgage side is a little, it could be easier depending. I think it's a lot more strenuous work, uh, to be honest, versus real estate, depending on how many clients you have. But at least with the real estate agent, you're not, you're tied to them to the degree, like, like on, on average, a lot of real estate agents don't even know, really know, need to know much. Like <laughs> you could kind of pass just by saying, oh, it's a nice property and just doing some research on the property. A lot of the math ends up getting figured out with their mortgage broker anyway. So if you're just like a good talker <laughs> and you know a couple things, like, yeah, you can get away with it, but I think the best agents are the ones who can do both. And that's something I have done in the past, like ran numbers with the people prior to them buying. So this way they were fully prepared. Although some people said it was stupid because you lose deals because they get scared and stuff. But I don't know. I just like having people be fully aware because that's what I'm interested in, like the numbers and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think there's a world where it crossed over. I think it's just the barrier to entry was much lower and that's why I chose agent. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. What we covered so far was a lot of inputs into maybe earning money, spending money, saving money, and everything money related. And the overarching question I want to ask you mm-hmm. is what is your end goal when it comes to everything money? And you can answer it however you want, whether that's how much you want to earn per period, maybe what you want to have with said money and any which way. And I'll stop talking. It's a tough question to answer because, you know, in a world of moving goalposts, it's like, how can you, you never just have one direct goal for money necessarily. You know, there's some people that have like all the billion dollar, you know, net worth goal. Like, and I could see that I could see like that's enticing, but I also being truthful to myself, a lot of the times I just, if I'm making enough money to sustain my overhead and then probably like double that, usually I'm feeling pretty happy. You know, if it's more than that, then whatever. But usually if I'm like sustaining my normal life and I can go on vacations and do all these things, 
And then I have like, you know, maybe double that amount of money. So I'm like saving as well. Usually I'm at my happiest and my most secure. I, I just, okay, I could go through the motions and I'll just be consistent and just keep working whatever I've been doing. So like in that way, I'm aware of myself that like, okay, that could be done fairly easily. Like at this point in my life, maybe 5,000 a month might make that make sense. When I have a kid or if I, you know, end up buying like a house or something like that, I'm sure that goalpost might move to 10 or something like that. Um, but you know, at least for now, like my objective is again, it goes back to security. Am I bringing in enough to sustain my life and then some, you know, so this way I'm totally secure just in the, in the event of like, you know, losing jobs or anything like that, losing money in, you know, in the market or whatever. So I I wouldn't necessarily say an end goal because I know that too comes like the, the, I think the thing is a lot of people kind of rush it like, Oh, the, maybe the fire people, like they want to retire early and stuff like that. And I, I think I'm just of the mindset that I'm willing to wait all of the years, uh, not even necessarily wait. I just know that throughout the next 20 years, I will make whatever goal I would set for myself because I just, I, I like, if you become obsessed with something, like I want that to happen, I want to be secure. And maybe that means millions of dollars. Hopefully in the future that happens one day then that's great. And I just think like, I don't know. And I, I don't have the greatest foresight on a lot of things. I, I, I think out into the future for some things, but usually what it stems from is one core obsession and pushing that to the max. And at least for my life right now, it's YouTube. So, you know, at this moment, it's like, all I really care about is, again, like everyone says, providing as much value as possible. And what that looks like is just interesting, either entertaining or you know, informative videos I can put out there into the world. And we've already seen the likes of, you know, Spencer Johnson or Daniel Braun. Daniel Braun, because, you know, when I see his videos about putting money out there, like making 30000 in a month, that's really, like, eye-opening and also a great guiding light, a beacon of light to, to, to hopefully grow into at some point or another. So I'm like, if I think about a life where I'm making 30000 a month, I, I don't I don't think I would need anything else. And, and I think that still falls in on my, just my personality type. I'm not one to push extremes with lifestyles. I usually stay home. I don't do many things. And then a couple vacations here and there, and I'm happy. I'm usually happiest when I can obsess over something and grow that, whatever that skill is. In, in this case, it's YouTube. So it's like enjoying the process and knowing like maybe that 30K does come. Is it three years from now? Is it next year? Or is it 10 years from now? If it does come, and I know I'm working towards that ideal, which is one of my favorite quotes in life is, success is daily progression towards a worthy ideal. And I feel like if the worthy ideal is to just make enough money where I don't have to worry about it, well, then just keep working hard and the rest should fall into place. So it's tough to say because I I can't necessarily think in my mind like, oh, it's 3 million and then I'll take out 4% every single year. And okay, that's my 120K, you know, income, my 10K a month, um, you know, before taxes and stuff like that. I, I, I know that that's the case. And I know if I play my cards right and I work really, really hard, I think I'll get there eventually. So I don't know. I think it's just trusting the process and enjoying the process while you're there and just trusting that if you work really hard, you will get there at some day. So I don't know if that's a bad answer, but I just, I don't know. That makes perfect sense. I mean, it's basically saying you have uh, an amount that suffices your needs and wants Mm -hmm. and you may not need too much more. And what I hear is you already know it's going to happen similar to like manifestation or otherwise, but you're employing or deploying your skills and disciplines and what you can do your habits to, you know, follow along the journey and uh, have fun while you can, because once you get there at the end, I'll ask the question, let's say today, okay, three mils in your account or three mil in buffer or five, 10 mil, doesn't matter. Money is now not an issue for you. So your quote that you said, um, I don't know it verbatim, but it was success. Could you repeat it? Success is a daily progression towards a worthy ideal. So with that daily progression of a worthy ideal, if money's the ideal that's taken care of, what could be potentially that new ideal, uh, in your opinion, either today or what you think it could be, uh, just so, you know, money's taken care of, what else is there that you would potentially progress towards success in your definition? Yeah, and it's something that I've I've really toyed around with the idea of um, much more in the last year or so. And a lot of it stemmed from, well, a lot of it stemmed from my entire life. Like, I remember an old commercial, uh, I think it was uh, the script Hall of Fame, if you guys know that song. Um, I remember it was a UFC commercial, and it would show like John Jones, you know, heavy, you know, the, uh, um, you know, uh, light heavyweight champion, or wait, was he light heavyweight back then? No, he was a middleweight. 
was he middleweight? 185, wasn't he? I mean, maybe he was middleweight. I don't know. But he was, he was, you know, obviously Johnny Bones Jones, best there ever lived. You know, absolutely the best. Um, and he was, you know, he was in the, uh, he was part of that video of like the Hall of Fame. And I remember being like 14, 13 years old, just in my bedroom and at home, just looking at that, like, wow, maybe one day I would hope to be on like a commercial like this or to be in a Hall of Fame or just a known person. Like, and I, I remember that distinctly, that, that idea that never really left me. And I kind of forgot about it over time. And then I recently watched the Elvis movie. I don't know if you did. You watch the Elvis movie, no, so maybe. it goes through his life from kid to, okay. fortunately, passing away. Okay. Yeah, so going through his entire life, and you can see his rise from, I don't know, learning the skills and learning from the the folks around him and in, in, in you know that community and learning how to dance and having the music flow through him, and then eventually putting that all in his own synergy and putting that on stage and giving literally all of his being to something, to where. He's now uh, a household name, no matter who you are, whether you're five years old or 50, you know Elvis, you know, and I love that. And I love that because if you, if you watched all of his old performances and I get there's a lot of movies nowadays where it's like, oh, underage girls and stuff, but <laughs> I get it, but I'm, I'm merely preserving the sentiment right. of which he had the passion, he had the God given gifts that he had, and he was able to harness that and give and push all of that energy and all of his being out into the world so that everyone could enjoy it and, and have a good time. And now he's a household name. I don't think I have anything <laughs> close to Elvis, but I just can't help but keep thinking in my mind like, if I can just provide something of value and if I can just push it with all my heart and all my energy, maybe one day, and I get a little emotional thinking about it, but maybe one day it could be some sort of like household name. I don't know. I don't know why I think about it like that, but I don't know. Maybe one day it could mean something <laughs> to somebody. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you for joining. Thank you for sharing, Drew. And thanks everyone for watching. <laughs> and words. there, any final words? <laughs> 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 just crying and leaving. All right, man. Um, no, my final words are: uh, life is really fun, and you can do whatever you want in life. And I've always been of the opinion that nothing matters really, because anyone could pass away tomorrow, unfortunately, and anybody could be anybody, but. If life doesn't matter and life really is a game, you might as well play it as such. You might as well do everything you could possibly do now, whatever you have, your skill, your being, push it out to the world now. Because, well, if you don't, you'll eventually become to an age, you'll get to an age where you regret it. Or at the very least, you just push more positivity out into the world and hopefully that comes back to you. But again, it's like life doesn't matter. Do what you want. <laughs> as long as you're not hurting other people, of course, like that, because, you know, that's not good. But. Do, do everything you could possibly do in life to enjoy it and to have a fruitful one. So make money, be really happy, make really great friendships, and have really good times because we're not here for very, very long. So that's what I would say. Love it. Thank you very much, guys. I'm going to go cry. <laughs> Till the next one. <laughs> See ya. See you again.